Part of the purpose of making this channel was not only to give fair coverage to a type of game which has long been overlooked by the media at large, but also to give coverage to other games which fit into a similar formula as the Warrior series. Belonging to the broad genre of what I would call Warriors likes, these games attempt to replicate the formula which has been so successfully established by Koei Tecmo, or more specifically, the studio responsible under their wing, Omega Force. There are plenty of Warriors likes out there, and in the months since this channel's debut, I have played or researched many of them. This is what led me to the two current Fate Extella releases, which I believe are not only the most successful games at replicating the Warriors formula, but both in their own ways managed to push the envelope even further. When I first started up Fate Extella The Umbral Star, I knew this was a series I was going to come to know very well. Set in a straight-up bonkers setting with entertaining over-the-top characters, the Warriors-like gameplay of this entry is truly only half the picture here. After jumping blindly in, I became absolutely focused on this game. Having now navigated its surprisingly complex story, as well as spent a good amount of time with all of the 17 playstyles, my journey here was certainly an interesting one at the end of the day. In many ways, my own appreciation of it was its own little roller coaster, constantly going up and down. At some points, I was ready to just move on to another game already. Yet, at other times, I was completely enthralled and begging to know what would happen next. Before going further into my experience with this game, I should probably do some proper setup. Fate Extella the Umbral Star was released in 2017, first in January on the PlayStation 4 and Vita, and then in July on the Nintendo Switch. Being the first game in the longer-running Fate series to use this type of gameplay, it was a huge departure for the series and basically exists in its own little world. Starting from Fate Extra, this branch of the many games which make up the Nasuverse, named for Kinoko Nasu, exist completely independently. Fate games are known for their very complex and twisted narratives, something which has made it one of the most niche series out there. But as I dipped my toe into this entry as my first exposure to it, I soon found out that the community around this game series is actually one of the friendliest fan bases out there. Many people who saw my initial videos on this game quickly reached out to offer to help me understand any of the past lore or settings that they thought might be confusing for me. Only one person was kind of a dick, but I mean, there's always one. Bullheaded as I am, I decided to go in blind anyways, and although in retrospect I probably should have accepted their help, after wrapping my head around where I was and what in the world was going on, understanding the rest was really not too bad. I'm going to try to break down the story of this game in as understandable a way as I can, while still being spoiler free. First of all, we are not in the real world. Instead, our setting here is a digital world on a server on the moon. Yes, that's right, it's on the moon, but that doesn't really matter as much as you you might think. You play as the Praetor, the winner of a war which happened in the previous game which gave him control of this server world named Seraph. Your character is a powerful hacker, called a wizard in this case, but your primary form of defense comes from your servants, who are the fantastically dressed gals and guys who make up the playable cast of this game. Interestingly, each servant here takes their form from a famous character throughout Earth's history. Basically, the Fate series takes the names and deeds of these famed individuals and in interprets them very loosely in order to make up its cast, and I have to say the varied cast of servants to be found here makes for one of the most enjoyable rosters of any Warriors game I've played. Shortly into your own character's rule of Seraph, a mysterious tragedy strikes which causes your character's digital avatar to be split into multiple pieces, with you starting the game as an avatar which contains your mind, lacking the soul and body avatars. It's easy to get lost on the specifics, so I'll just simplify what this actually means in the game. Your character is in danger of fading away and needs to quickly reunite with the lost parts of himself. Each part of him has appeared in different locations on Seraph, with its own servant who is desperately loyal to it. And throughout the story mode, you get to play from your own three perspectives. Although the first two parts of this story may convince you that there's nothing that big going on, it was actually at the start of the final third when the game completely plays its hand and reveals why this setup was necessary. And at that moment, I became thoroughly hooked and needed needed to see where it was all heading towards. I've got to say that this is the first Warriors game I've played where the story mode of all things was the absolute highlight of the experience. The Umbral Star is absolutely filled to the brim with entertainingly written dialogue and character scenes, with longer stretches of time often going towards the story over the gameplay, which was something that I didn't think I would appreciate at first, but as the story soon became my favorite part of the experience, this gradually shifted into a very big positive. 
The other side of this coin here is the gameplay, and I have to say, despite some promise, it is overall pretty rough. On a surface level, Fate Extella gets a lot of things right when emulating the Warriors formula. First of all, it does feel great to play as these mini servants. On top of having some pretty interesting movesets, each character also has a lot more mobility. From jumps, double jumps, dodges, air dodges, and full-on flight, moving around the battlefield just feels great, even though certain parts of the maps can be a bit hard to navigate. In in place of the traditional Muso bar, characters have the Extella Maneuver, an attack which only uses one portion to start it up, but can then be extended through successive button presses, allowing you to still use it in important times without fully pouring all of your resources into one single moment. Topping this off, you have equipable item sets, which gives you the freedom to initiate certain power-ups or heals as you see fit and as your resources allow. And finally, we have the extremely powerful Noble Phantasm, a kind of super attack which can be used by gathering three phantasm circuits which are scattered all around the map. All in all, I really like using these characters. For sure, I ended up liking some more than others, but on the whole, it really is a grand time checking out the full cast after finishing the story mode. Despite this being Marvelous's first time at this, it's really clear that a lot of work was put into making these servants play like a new breed of hyper-mobile warriors fighters. It is then such a shame that when it comes to the battles themselves, they completely drop the ball. And here's why. In place of one giant map, the battlefields of Fate Extella are broken down into sectors, which can be traveled to nearly instantly by utilizing various exits. My first impression of this was that it would cut out travel time tremendously, removing the need to march your warrior through completely empty territory, but this turned out to not be the case. In actuality, many of these various sectors are very sizable, and rushing around the maps freely became more corridorized than ever before. Instead of looking for shortcuts across the map, all you can really do is just follow the correct path when trying to rush to any specific sector. When you actually arrive in one of these sectors, the capture system that they use will of course seem very familiar. But for some inexplicable reason, this game chose to painfully and unnecessarily stretch out the amount of time that it takes to capture one. Represented by these slowly filling gauges, you will need to defeat huge numbers of common foes in order for their leaders to appear. But rather than fighting to produce one leader who needs to be killed, the various sectors here all have differing numbers of VIPs who need to be spawned and defeated in this way. Sometimes multiple waves of these big units must be spawned in, requiring you to repeat this whole chore very frequently, and in every single sector you're trying to take. One would hope that taking a sector would very strongly secure it then, but in actuality, holding your own sectors is a frustrating chore, one which requires you to repeat the previous grind if you fail or simply can't keep up with the source of invasions on the maps, which all come from the extremely annoying enemy types called plants. Plants are these little UFO guys who are able to spawn in units which invade your other sectors. This naturally means that whenever one appears, you're going to want to divert your resources instantly to trying to kill it whenever possible. But this is only something that would really work if only one plant was available at any time. Usually, battles start with multiple invasions happening all at once. And if you don't somehow kill the plant and also defend the sectors, you can go from in control to game over with truly upsetting speed. Damage control is often the priority in the first parts of these battles, and that's often not a strategy which gives the player the freedom to eliminate these foes whenever they choose. Almost every battle begins with a panic, something which only calms down when you have defended or seized enough territory to stop any sudden game overs from happening while you try to deal with the plants. Unfortunately, for a reason I cannot fathom, plants are given astonishingly frequent respawn rates, and one can appear as soon as another one has died, and on top of that, they will immediately start acting as soon as they respawn appear. I really feel that the game just holds on to plant spawns so they can immediately use it as soon as you finish killing one. After 15 or so minutes of panic and dealing with plants, you'll likely eventually get enough command points to take control of the map, and will also then cause the boss to spawn. After that, you fight the boss and you finish the map, and I really hope that you enjoyed this type of gameplay, because other than a few one-offs, this is really the only kind of battle that this game consists of. By focusing entirely around this frustrating tug-of-war sector capture system, the Umbral Star can often be very exhausting to play one battle after the other. Something which I have to say is not a sensation I associate with Warriors types. In fact, this is the reason why I think that the long dialogue breaks in the story mode are often more than welcome, because simply repeating this kind of frustrating battle one after the other can really get tiresome fast. The critical flaw that I think that we're seeing here is really just very poor balancing, like 
likely due to this being this studio's first attempt at this. If it took less time to capture sectors, or if there were more time between plants, the player would have a lot more control over where they could be, as well as having better options for planning where they wanted to go next, without being forced to choose based on very frequent plant spawns. I still maintain that it is the small decisions in battles, not overly complicated gameplay, that makes the Warriors games able to be played for as absurdly long as they are by its many fans. When I was in the moment playing Fate Extell of the Umbral Star, finding myself in yet another sector which was clearly the best place to be, tiresomely clearing out trash mobs to spawn in an aggressor which wasn't even going to clear the sector after its defeat, I have to admit that I really zoned out. In truth, I only continued going so that I could see what would happen next in the story. When it comes to the post-game, I really could not be bothered, consisting of many campaigns with far, far less production value. Each of the other characters can be used here in repeats of story mode battles from a slightly different perspective. And honestly, this was where I was ready to throw in the towel and simply move on to greener pastures, if you get me. Despite being just kind of meh on the gameplay at the end of the day, in many ways, the Umbral Star does come close to greatness. The amount of movement for every character, the concept of creating maps which are individual battlefields joined by jump points, there's a lot to love here that is just begging for further refinement. Whether this system gets the refinement it deserves in its sequel is something we're going to have to look at next time. At the end of the day, I would recommend Fate Extella the Umbral Star with some pretty major asterisks. As an entry point to the series, something that many Warriors games do well, it works just fine. The strange setting takes some time to adjust to, but Honestly, after watching this video, you're probably fine to just jump in. Honestly, the simple charisma and interesting origins and personalities of each character is enough to bring most players through to the end. Of course, all of this is then backed up by this game's beautiful soundtrack, energetic Japanese voice acting, and fantastic character designs, something which allowed me to easily look past the generally poor resolution and somewhat dated look that it has. Overall, I am extremely happy that I played through this game, but at times, it was a struggle to get to that appreciation. Next up, we're going to be getting into this game game's somewhat sequel, 2018's Fate Extel Link, and hopefully we'll be able to find out if it was or wasn't able to capitalize on this first game's promise while polishing up its various flaws. I'll see you next time, everyone. I'd like to give a special thank you to my top patrons Minute Rice, Henry Gutierrez, and Ignis Isol, as well as everybody else who's currently supporting me on Patreon. Thank you all very much. <laughs>